So welcome everyone. We are delighted to have Professor Fabian Presser here with us today to talk about the data anonymization tool ARX. Fabian Presser is a professor of medical informatics at the Berlin Institute of Health BIH of Charité and head of the medical informatics group at BIH. His research interests include the design and implementation of data infrastructures for transnational medical research and related privacy and information security challenges. One of his major research focuses is privacy enhancing technologies and anonymization techniques for medical data. He leads the development of an internationally recognized anonymization tool, ARX. Now let's give a warm welcome to Professor Fabian Presser. So thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, hello to everyone attending today's workshop. Um, as already mentioned, um, I'm one of the core developers of ARX, quite, quite a well-known tool for anonymizing structured tabular data. And in today's workshop, I will introduce you to ARX and also will provide you with some practical examples um, ba based on some theory. You already uh, had a theory workshop as part of this lecture series. I will recap that a bit and then really delve into a let's say, practical demonstration of an anonymization process um, using ARX. So let me quickly provide you with an overview of the agenda. As mentioned, I will shortly recap the um, sort of key points of, of uh, the last uh, workshop you had on this topic from, from Christy Thompson and provide you with a bit more of a background on risk-based data anonymization, which we will also then apply in practice. I will proceed to talk to uh, talk about the associated topic of adversarial modeling. So how can we reason about potential threats that uh, there might exist uh, for the privacy of respondents or subjects represented in certain data sets? And how uh, can we consider, then consider this when actually anonymizing the data I will then proceed to introduce you to ARX, just a few sort of key points um, about the software before I will start the practical exercises. And we will do a short, or the practical demonstration, and we will do a short break of roughly five, min five minutes, likely between uh, the third and fourth part of this uh, workshop, um, so that we can all sort of uh, fully concentrate on the practical demo. I then have a few suggestions on, on further readings, uh, should you be uh, interested more in the topic. And finally, we will do a Q&A together. So let me start by recapitulating and introducing a few basic concepts about data anonymization with a specific focus on considering the context in which data is being shared. Like the general, sort of foundational concept behind uh, data anonymization is a bit like like magic, right? You have a data set, it's personal, consisting of personal information, and then there's some form of magic that happens, and in the end, you have non-personal information that you can then share more broadly within the context of uh, data protection regulations. And on this slide, I have a very simple example. It's a very simple medical data set, the tabular form, which you can see uh, that consists of information about the age, the sex, the zip code of, the, uh, of, of where the people live, some information on their weight, and also a diagnosis that have, has, for example, been recorded within a hospital information system. And this magic in practice usually means that something is being done to the data set. And there's a wide range of different, I will call them transformations in the remainder of this workshop. And that's also the terminology that we use in ARX that can be applied to a data set to protect the privacy of the subjects um, about which information is um, contained in the data set. And here I have six examples of common methods um, that are used in this space. Um, one is random sampling. You can see here that a sample, it's indicated by the yellow box that a sample has been taken of the data set. So here's the, maybe I should say this, the output data set for the associated input data set. And a random sample has been taken of the records that are included in the output data set. 
In addition, there is aggregation that has happened here to the age information um, about the patients or data subjects, um, where you can see that within a certain group of individuals that have comparable characteristics, a common age information has been created by aggregating um, the values for the individual data subjects. Another common technique that is, has been applied here is deletion. We can see that some um, sex information has been deleted from this data set. Masking is applied to the zip code here. Depends a bit on how zip codes are structured in certain, certain parts of the world. If they have something like a um, like a um, <clears throat> like a like an order right where you can sort of um, make the information about the geographic region more general by dropping digits of the zip code and masking is a technique that can be applied here. This is the case in Germany, for example, to a certain degree. Um, another common technique that has been applied here is categorization. We can see that the weight information about the individual patients has been um, categorized into certain um, weight categories. And finally, another type of um, transformation that has been applied here that is quite common is generalization. In this case, it has been applied to the coded diagnosis. Um, these diagnoses have been represented using the so-called international classification of diseases, which is a, um, a standard or, or a terminology for encoding diagnosis that, um, uh, that has a hierarchical structure. And you can see here that by dropping a certain part of the code, this has become more specific, more general by removing, in this case, the localization of the different neoplasms and that those patients suffer from. And in the end, we have a data set that fulfills certain guarantees in regards to the uh, protection from privacy breaches, one model which is quite known and has also been introduced in the previous workshop um, is k-anonymity. It's quite a simple concept. We're given a set of variables, in this case, all variables or attributes that exist within this data set. Um, we, we require the output data set to only consist of records that are indistinguishable from at least a certain number of other records in the data set. We can see here that this number is three and that we have two groups of three patients uh, that are in the two groups of three patients each that are indistinguishable within this um, within uh, their respective group. But at the same time, this data set, given some assumptions about how exactly the transformation process has been performed, also fulfills a more modern um, privacy definition called differential privacy, um, which places some restrictions on the output of certain randomized algorithms. In this case, one assumption would be that. Um, the transformation that has been applied here has been performed in a data independent manner. These are all also techniques that are supported um, within ARX. So maybe let me go back for a second. So we can see now a set of transformations that are typically used to create protected data sets. But at the same time, we also see that a lot has happened to the data set. Quite significant changes have been made. And of course, this can uh, lead to significant reductions in, for example, the scientific utility of a data set or introduce statistical biases. And this directly brings us to sort of the core challenge that we have to deal with uh, when anonymizing data. And that is that we have to somehow trade off the degree of protection that we can achieve against the usefulness of the output data set. And this is visualized here in this, in this abstract um, graph where you can see the degree of protection that has been achieved on the y-axis and the, the utility or usefulness of the output data set on the x-axis. And there are a few extreme points here, like down here would be an extreme point where there's no protection at all. Uh, no, but there was the maximum protection, excuse me for the mistake on the slide, um, but you also have no data available. Um, up here, you would have an, uh, the situation where you have the maximum degree of protection, but you have no data or no usefulness at all. Here, you would have no protection at all, but the maximal, maximum usefulness or data set in a sort of unchanged or an unanonymized form. And ideally, of course, we would like to have a sort of end up in a situation where we are up here, we achieve the maximum degree of protection, no form of privacy risks at all for the data subjects. And at the same time, it's a data set that's perfectly useful um, for the scientific sort of downstream scientific tasks or analyses um, that uh, people would like to perform on the data. 
But unfortunately, it's of course not possible to achieve such a such a such a spot here um, because there's trade-offs that have to be made. And when making this trade-off, we have to be careful that we sort of end up with, with a good solution that might be somewhere here where you have a strong degree of protection or a high degree of protection that you can achieve, while at the same time, there's also just a, let's say, acceptable input on the usefulness of the data set. And typically, this sweet spot can only be achieved if you sort of analyze the context in which the data is being shared and in which the data is supposed to be used in the future. So questions you need to answer is like, how can I even measure the degree of anonymity? I already showed in my simple uh, toy example in the beginning that there are different models that have been suggested for this and they're are also differences between different legislations and what types of privacy risks have to be sort of considered when reasoning about the anonymity of a data set. So this implies asking questions that, uh, such as what does it actually mean to re-identify individuals or breach someone, someone's privacy? And also as risks can never be reduced to zero on a data set level alone, but also in general, um, you need to think about acceptable risks, right? So what is the threshold um, that I can apply so that if my residual risk is below the threshold, I can consider a data set protected. But there are also questions that need to be asked and answered on the sort of utility side of things. Um, it is ideally a good idea to know what types of analyses um, downstream users of the data might be interested in and what types of relationships, for example, should be preserved between the variables or whether there are any additional requirements, like certain variables that definitely have to be present, variables that are not so important um, for downstream analysis. So a range of questions that if you have the answers to, that somehow helps you to optimize and tailor your anonymization process to the specific context um, in which you plan to anonymize and share data. Now, one additional important point that I would like, like to make is um, that I clearly suggest to apply a risk-based approach. So first of all, there's residual risks, of course. You need to have an idea of a certain risk threshold um, that, that you can apply to your scenario. But I would also suggest to consider anonymization, so measures that are being taken on the data level as part of a multi-layered approach to, to protecting and securing the process of sharing data. And um, there's one quite well-known framework that can help you with this. That's the so-called five safes framework, um, which basically says that there are different independent axes along which a certain degree of protection can be achieved that if, um, if combined with each other in an optimal way, allow you to improve the risk utility trade-off that you can achieve when sharing data. And um, this framework suggests five axes, safe people, safe projects, safe data, safe settings, and safe outputs, where safe people basically refers to the fact that you should potentially think about having measures in place with which you can to control, for example, that or, or which can sure ensure, for example, that only trustworthy individuals are, access, are accessing your data set. And this could be a certain platform through which the data is being shared, but this could also be, for example, data use contracts that need to be signed um, before the data is being used. The second access safe project refers to the fact that you should try to ensure that only, um, let's say, ethically um, uh, ethically valid and sensible um, types of analysis should be done on the data and also that there is processes involved that, that ensure that the data is actually suited for answering a certain research question. So that's something that the field of medicine, for example, ethics committees or IRBs um, would, would uh, sort of help to decide upon. And then there's safe data, safe settings, and safe outputs, which are more on the technical side of things. And this is where anonymization comes into play with safe data, referring to the fact that the data that, uh, that is being shared should, of course, be in itself as safe as possible. You can achieve this by anonymization processes, as I will demonstrate today. But if there are residual risks, potentially even larger residual risks that you cannot address with um, anonymization alone, data should be shared within a safe setting. This can be something like a safe haven where remote access is being provided for analyzing a data, uh, for, for analyzing a data set, um, or also 
a lot of or a selection of a lot of modern techniques that exist for providing secure access to analyzing your data and through cryptographic mechanisms, secure multi-party computing protocols, for example. So lots of innovation that is happening um, in the space at the moment. And finally, safe outputs. So you should try to ensure that also if outputs are generated from a data set, um, those are, for example, published in scientific articles, that those outputs are also safe and don't breach the privacy of the data subjects or subjects or leak any form of sensitive information. And of course, there's some form of, um, to some, some degree, protection propagates through this change. So data that is safe in certain degrees already on the data level will automatically result in safe outputs when they are calculated from the safe data. Um, but if there's a larger sort of degree of residual risk that you're countering through sharing data in a safe setting, then safe outputs is something that potentially needs to be, or that potentially needs to be controlled as well. And that can, for example, be done through only offering a certain set of analytical functions on top of the data. And um, if this process is being applied, this can ideally help you to, to basically achieve a shift in the risk utility or protection utility curve from a scenario where the trade-off is not so optimal to a scenario where you can achieve quite a high degree of utility at the same time with quite a high degree of protection because there's sort of this gray area that uh, stands for the additional protections that you can apply on top of sim of just anonymizing um, a data set and at this point it also makes sense to to somewhat refer back to this sort of modern concept of privacy protection that I already mentioned called differential privacy because differential privacy which by many is considered to be sort of a gold standard of um of processing data in a privacy preserving manner is also a property that does not Ref, uh, apply to a data set or refer to a data, data set like k anonymity does, which is a sort of structural constraint that you place on a data set, but it refers more to a process. It's a property of a process. And I would like to advocate for seeing anonym, anonymity or privacy protection also as a property of the overall process in which data is being shared and used. So this directly brings me to this adversarial modeling aspect. So if you um, if you work on optimizing your risk utility trade-off, and this also requires you to reason about potential adversarial scenarios, about scenarios in which things could go wrong. So which recipients of your data of your data set might be interested or have the ability um, to breach the privacy of the data subjects in, in, in which ways. And there are um, also a few concepts that have been suggested for this. Um, this also can, for example, be used to identify quasi-identifying variables, so a common mechanism in which adversarial modeling plays a role. Um, just to recap, Christy has uh, covered this in the last workshop, a quasi-identifier, sometimes also called an in indirect identifier or a key variable, is a term for, um, for attributes within a data set that might be known to adversaries and that could be combined to form a unique key that can then be used to link external information or background knowledge against the data set. And one common way of doing risk-based anonymization is to apply um, a structured process to identifying such variables. And there's different, different such approaches. And one approach which always makes sense is to, to apply what I call the catalog-based approach. So there's a range of um, catalogs, basically, of variables that have been suggested, for example, in the uh, HIPAA um, safe harbor method as part of the HIPAA privacy rule, the safe harbor method. And um, there is a set of 18 identifiers that has been specified that need to be removed from a data set. So this can give you an idea of variables that have that um, so certain agencies or governments uh, or or um, other types of institutions have found to be associated with a high level of risk uh, of re-identification, but there's other such um, catalogs that have been published, for example, also in the UK from the data anonymization guideline from the National Health Services. And um, so first step would be to go through your data set and see whether there are variables in there that have been considered to be risky in certain catalogs that you can 
that you can find. In addition to that, or as an alternative, you can also apply a qualitative approach um, to analyzing certain aspects of the variables within certain usage contexts. And there's a methodology that has been suggested by Malin and colleagues for doing this, um, which basically says you need or you should think about the replicability of information. Um, so that's sort of the likelihood that a certain characteristic will reoccur um, uh, repeatedly um, in, in relationship to certain individuals, the availability of this information, so whether there are any external resources that might contain those replicable features and um, whether adversaries might have access to those external resources. And finally, also the uniqueness or distinctness, it's called on this slide of, this info, um, of, of the variables in a data set. So to which extent certain characteristics make subjects in your data set distinguishable from others. And I brought a few examples here um, <clears throat> that I think are also taken from the original publication by Mali, Malin and colleagues, um, where you can see that, for example, uh, blood glucose tests uh, have quite a variety in what is being measured. So replicability is relatively low. Um, as compared to demographic data, which are usually static in relationship to a certain um, person. At the same time, if we think about availability, then laboratory findings are usually only known within a healthcare context and not that much to people working outside of the healthcare field. While again, taking demographics as an example, and they are included or they're Often they're actually uh, available quite openly as information or are, in, for example, contained in marriage registers or registries or in death registries. And if we take a look at the uniqueness of variables or the distinguishability, um, then sex or gender would be something that usually has a relatively low degree of distinguishability because there's quite a lot of people that share the certain characteristics. But if individuals have a rare disease, that's something that doesn't occur that, that often and uh, therefore leads to quite a significant degree of distinguishability. And then you can rank the variables, for example, in your data set using those uh, different different um, aspects. And for example, in, use a threshold approach to decide which variables need to be protected and which don't. And um, or which variables need to be addressed in an anonymization process to, um, to prevent linkage from happening. And um, there's also an, a range of quantitative methods that can be used. So, for example, that's a, a, say quite a quite a common thing to do. Um, you can, of course, also study how distinguishable or unique certain pieces of information are within, within your data set, or to what degree um, it 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 helps to distinguish different individuals from each other. So that would be a, a common sort of quantitative a measurement that you can get from a data set to also inform decisions about what what variables uh, might need to be changed to prevent privacy breaches. So on this slide, I have an example that also already refers uh, to, to the demonstration that I will be doing in a few minutes where we have applied this to, to a very sort of high level overview about um, patients uh, with COVID-19 diagnosis. And you can see here that certain variables have been identified um, to need protection in this case because the threshold of, of six that has been applied, and you can see that following this analysis, replicability, availability, and distinguishability of information, a decision has been made on, as I said, variables that need to be um, protected, and how exactly this can be done, um, we will cover in more detail as part of the live presentation. But, there are other things that can be considered um, what individuals might want or what adversaries might want to find out. So um, first, I, I wanted to add that what you can, of course, do and usually should do is potentially model more than one adversary, right? It depends on the scenario, whether it's a relatively open way of sharing a data set or whether you're sharing it in a controlled environment to a predefined set of, um, of, of recipients. Um, Depends a bit, of course, but still there might be different types of adversaries that you can model. So you might have more than one categorization of the variables in your data set that then help you to inform what needs to be done to the data set to 
create a protected version of it. But in addition to reasoning about what information an adversary might know, there are other aspects that are quite common uh, that people um, try to consider when anonymizing a data set. And one is the goals of uh, the adversary in regards to the to the data set that is being attacked or yeah, the data set that is being attacked. And um, here again, different scenarios can be distinguished. The most common scenario is really re-identification, also called identity disclosure, disclosure in the literature. Um, here the question or the aim of the adversary really is to, to identify a specific record in a data set that refers to a certain individual. And this, of course, leak, might leak all various kinds of additional information, also information that was not used for linkage. If there are certain additional variables in the data set, and then this information, of course, gets known to the adversary as a result of the linkage process. However, and um, Christy has also covered this in the last workshop, um, adversaries could potentially also learn information about the individuals within a data set without necessarily being able to associate them to a specific record. They might only be interested in finding out that coming back to the simple example I had in the beginning, for example, the diagnosis associated with the person. And even if it's just possible to determine that this individual is within a group of, let's say, three individuals, if they all share the same diagnosis, then I'm, of course, or the adversary can, of course, um, learn this diagnosis from the data set. So that's called attribute disclosure and can be sort of a goal that an adversary has that is different from um, really pointing towards the specific record that refers to a certain individuals and something um, which can be more challenging to prevent actually than, um, than re-identification attacks because also those attacks potentially become um, yeah, easier to do. And um, the, the final type of uh, disclosure that I would like to introduce is membership disclosure. It's sort of a special case of attribute disclosure, where as an adversary, I don't, um, I'm not able to specifically associate an individual with a certain record. I'm not even interested in learning a specific variable, but it's sufficient to simply find out that this individual or that data about this individual is contained in the data set. This can be a problem. Let's assume that it's a data set from a cancer registry and the fact that this person is included is already um, sort of a, a, a privacy breach. And again, um, this can be challenging um, to prevent, more challenging usually than preventing identity disclosure. Now, another aspect that uh, can be considered that is somehow related to this is whether or not um, the, adver the adversary already knows that an individual is included in a data set. And this is somewhat the difference between the so-called prosecutor and journalist scenario, where in the prosecutor scenario, it is assumed that the adversary already knows that an, that an individual is in the data set and tries to re-identify the specific record or obtain additional information, attribute disclosure in this case about the specific individual, while in the journalist scenario, I don't care that much about a specific individual, but I'm just interested in, in, um, in uh, finding out or breaching the privacy of somebody, for example, because I want to, um, <clears throat> I want to make a point. And here the assumption is that I, as a journalist, I'm not aware of the fact whether or not information about this individual is already included in the data set. Um, so this is basically before membership um, yeah, before membership of the individual is, is clear. And this can sort of be used to more, um, to get a more nuanced view of the risk that individuals or that the records in the data set might be uh, associated with in regards to various types of privacy breaches. And finally, um, sometimes also the case is considered where um, an adversary is, is not interested in correctly linking specific individuals like you would do as a journalist where it, you don't really care about which individual is, but you want to be sure about the linkage for that specific individual to make a point or the prosecutor where you're interested in a specific individual in the first place. But the marketer is more interested in generally um, having quite a quite a high success rate. So you have two larger data sets, you link them against each other. You don't really care a lot about the correctness of individual linkage, but you're interested in having, let's say, a significant success rate on average because you, for example, would like to send out spam mails. And this again, if you uh, consider this scenario, there's other risk models that you can use um, to quantify 
um, the success rate or to quantify um, the, the likelihood that, that, an, that an attack would be successful, which again can help you to, to measure risks and to reduce risks um, by transforming a data set. So this brings me um, to ARX and to the introduction of ARX, which is one tool um, that you can use for this purpose. And then in the end, I will also have a few, as I mentioned, suggestions for, for further readings and also for other tools that could be used. But one of them is um, ARX. And um, just to provide you with a, <clears throat> with a few key facts about ARX, um, ARX is a relatively comprehensive tool that is focused specifically on, on anonymizing tabular data. And has been developed for over 10 years now with constant updates, uh, quite, quite a high degree of adoption. Originally, it has been developed with a focus on health data, so with a focus on methods that have been suggested for protecting health data, but it can and is in practice also be applied to a wide range of data types that don't come from a, a medical context. Um, it has been released for the first time. I think the original publications date back even a bit longer in 2014. We are maintaining the software. It's provided uh, under a permissive, permissive license, so the Apache 2 license, which basically, basically allows you um, to do a lot um, with the software. It's also an industry-friendly license. That's why uh, quite a lot of uh, software vendors have actually picked up ARX and, um, for example, integrated it into products that they are selling. We do support a very wide variety of methods for measuring privacy risks. So I already mentioned K-anonymity. I mentioned differential privacy. But there are also other models that can be used to, um, to somehow capture risks and uh, likelihoods that things go wrong um, depending on the specific goals of an adversary that I just mentioned. I'm personally not aware of any other um, publicly available tool that offers such a broad spectrum of, of risk models. We also support quite a wide variety of transformation methods. Um, <clears throat> all of the ones that I said, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, all of the ones that I um, introduced in the beginning, plus a few additional sort of variations of the different methods, so performing a generalization, taking samples, aggregating, categorizing data, various types of suppression or deletion in different forms. I will demonstrate all, all this um, in, the, in the practical part in a few minutes. And um, finally, it also has um, Quite, some, quite a lot of integrated methods for estimating the utility of a data set. So measuring the degree of information loss, for example, that has been resulted from certain transformations, um, but also doing, um, for example, classification tasks and see um, how um, the transformation has impacted the statistical properties of a data set. But still, um, I must say that really getting an idea of the usefulness as, as of a data that often also requires running certain types of analysis. And it can also, um, for example, trying to replicate certain analyses that have been performed on the original data. And that is something where you then might want to use additional statistical programming environments to, to really see um, or to, to get an in-depth you know, picture of, of the utility of an anonymized um, data set. ARX is also known for being quite scalable. So um, it, we have published a range of papers um, on ARX and um, basically outperforms um, most techniques that have been suggested in the literature. You can use ARX to anonymize data sets with billions of records. It should, for all sort of say reasonably sized data sets, they should have no challenges at all just running this on a common, um, let's say, laptop that people are using nowadays. We have specific algorithms including for uh, included for handling relatively high dimensional data, which is a specific challenge um, in data anonymization from the perspective of computational complexity and performance, as well as from the perspective of uh, trading off the degree of protection against the usefulness um, of data. Um, it's available as a graphical tool, um, a sc screenshot here included, but um, um, we will see it in a few minutes in, in action anyways. And um, but this also um, has led to the fact that ARX is actually used quite a lot in education and training, in workshops. There are commercial but also public institutions uh, that, that run courses using ARX because it, 
although it has quite some complexity, um, it's relatively easy to use, I would say, uh, for a software that, um, that allows those relatively complex types of transformation and anonymization um, algorithms to be executed on a data set. I would also like to add at this point that those different methods that I presented for measuring risks, utility, transforming data, you are basically almost free to combine them as you wish in ARX, which is also something that is specific um, in comparison to other anonymization tools or algorithms that have been suggested, which are very often actually um, tailored towards a specific type of transformation, a specific type of measuring risks. While here in ARX, we have aimed to provide users with quite some flexibility in how they use the software, um, which also helps to, to tailor anonymization processes to the requirements um, that there, or the differences in requirements that there might be between different domains, but also, for example, between uh, different legislations. ARX is also available as a as a programming library um, within the Java ecosystem, which is one of the ecosystems that is quite frequently used for data processing tasks. So ARX has also been um, integrated quite often into um, more complex data processing pipelines. And there's also, while there is a lot that you can do through the UI, um, you can have even more flexibility logically um, if you um, if, if, if you use the API and um, sort of implement and program the anonymization pipelines that uh, you need to or want to apply to your data set. There's a wide range of uh, cases in which ARX has been used. You can find a few open data sets on the internet that have been protected using ARX. Um, as I mentioned, it has also been used to implement quite a lot of, um, let's say, large data processing and anonymization pipelines in several domains. Um, institutions with which we have sort of collaborated quite frequently include in particular telecommunication providers, um, but also quite a lot of health insurance companies. It has an industry-friendly license. I mentioned this. It has been implemented in quite a few products. Um, also, SAP within their HANA platform, they have an anonymization module, which is based on the same core algorithm that we have developed for ARX. So it's basically a re-implementation um, with more than 50,000 downloads, which I think is actually quite a lot for, for a software that solves um, Lot of such a special type of problem. We have an active open source community. Quite a lot of people also from different institutions around the world have contributed um, to the development of the software. And um, what I really would like to emphasize or re-emphasize it is sort of based uh, on science. So all the algorithms, all the data structures, all the additional sort of degrees of, or the additional modules that have we, we have integrated into the software have been published in scientific journal and conference uh, papers. And um, so this is really something that's also a product um, of our scientific activities. And, um, yeah, where we have really sort of, uh, we're quite transparent about how ARX works. Of course, also open source software, but also the core concepts that sort of make ARX do what it does have been described. And should you be interested in this topic, feel free to, to delve into, into the papers, which are of course also all listed on our website. So, how does ARX look? Uh, here we can see a screenshot of uh, of the graphical front end of the application. I will go through this in detail in just a few minutes. Still would at this point quickly like to use uh, the opportunity um, to show that there are four basic perspectives in the software because this is a sort of a theme that will reoccur um, frequently uh, while doing the live demonstration. There's a configuration perspective where data sets are loaded, metadata is being specified, information about the anonymization process or requirements are being defined. Um, then there's an exploration perspective um, where the software provides an overview of different options that there might be for anonymizing a data set. This information is basically provided through executing certain optimization algorithms and processes within the software. So given your requirements as part of the configuration, the software will determine through an optimization process, a range of potentially interesting solutions to your anonymization problem, which are then presented in the exploration perspective. 
And then there's two perspectives. One is a focused on utility or data quality analysis, and the other one is focused on risk analysis, where you can sort of see always the focus is on sort of comparing input and output data, seeing what has happened to the data set um, as a result of the anonymization process, how has this impacted certain statistical properties, but also how has this impacted risks um, for the individuals reflected in the data set and um, what residual risks do exist for the data set that has been produced. And the idea is basically that you can use this to sort of implement an iterative process where you where you have a configuration and specification phase, and you then take a look at the results of the anonymization process, maybe tweak the parameterization, change your configuration until you come up with a data set that seems to be a good solution. And, and as I mentioned, then you might in many cases still want to do a sort of an additional utility analysis using or like a statistical analysis environment and um, to see for example whether certain types of analysis that are commonly being done on the data set uh, can be reproduced um, I already mentioned that that ARX has been widely adopted, has been around for 10 years. Um, it has also been picked up in quite a quite a lot of guidelines or reports that various types of uh, official institutions and agencies um, have published on, on uh, data anonymization. This is, I think, a little bit outdated, um, but still quite a comprehensive list that I won't go through in any detail. Um, generally speaking, I would suggest um, and I have recommended readings in the end, and that you, that you go through at least a few of the most common guidelines or, or read read one of the books that I will suggest um, for you start to apply this in practice. This is just a world map view of, of the um, guidelines that I just showed uh, to, to really illustrate that this has had sort of a global impact and has been mentioned in, in documents originating from a wide range of um, countries and, um, and, and jurisdictions. So at this point, I would uh, continue with the practical exercises. Um, I think it's also a good point. It's a little bit early still, but um, a good point to make the five minute break before I delve into the exercises. So we will meet again at uh, your time should be 9.50 in five minutes, and I will then do the practical part. Thanks. Welcome um, back, everyone. Um, I just took a look at the, the questions and answers form, and I think it probably makes sense to answer a few of the questions that you have asked before proceeding with the practical exercises um, or the practical demonstration. Um, I might not answer all of them now, but at least um, a few of them. So the first question um, would be whether or not researchers should describe the level and or process of anonymization in their informed consent form and um, report that to the ethics committee. And if so, how the details should be reported. Um, in, in, I would suggest to not describe this uh, in detail as part of the informed consent form because it will be very challenging for participants uh, to understand. In my experience, it's also quite challenging to discuss topics around data anonymization with the ethics review committee because they might also um, have challenges in understanding the specific concepts Usually, my uh, recommendation is to to discuss this, or I mean, or to develop a consent together with uh, data protection officers at your institution, um, or also alternatively, in or would even be a better option in, in some countries. There is also, um, for example, institutions uh, that are focused on developing or validating data anonymization processes. Um, sometimes there's also certifications available to a certain degree. Um, yeah, long story short, I think it should be um, should be a data protection specialist with which this is uh, being discussed. And um, also if you have um, if you have consent uh, collected for for um, 
for your study, which is of course good, then it's often also possible to, to share the data or use the data in a pseudonymized form. So in sort of, let's say a little bit of a weaker form of anonymization, and which is also good because it gives you better opportunities um, to uh, sort of achieve a good risk utility balance. So the second uh, question, that I would like to answer is um, whether anonymization should include masking data to ensure confidentiality. Um, I would say the answer is yes. Um, it really depends a bit on what specifically is understood under the term masking. Um, masking often has different meanings in different uh, contexts, but um, generally masking, for example, by dropping certain, certain um, digits within a code, for example, or masking by removing um, variables or certain other pieces of information completely is uh, clearly one aspect of data anonymization. Um, also masking is often understood as a term which is more related to generating a random data set that matches the same schema, so the same variables and data types than the data set that you have. Um, that's always something that is preferred if you uh, preferred to more, let's say, more formal anonymization processes that aim to create a data set that really captures the statistical properties of your input data set. And there might be cases where masking or the generation of artificial um, data or of random data might, might be an option if, for example, the, peop the person you're working with is um, just needs to, to have a data set that follows, has the same characteristics. So let's assume somebody is developing an algorithm and you want to execute the algorithm on the confidential data set that you have without sharing the data set itself, which is also one way of um, yeah, sharing, basically sharing data or making data accessible, then having a, a, an artificial data set generated that follows the schema of your original data set is one option to foster this process. Of course, the algorithm, if it's then executed on the artificial data set, will not really have a useful result, but it still helps to develop the algorithm or the analysis uh, to debug it to make sure that it can be executed on a data set. And that's also a process that we actually use quite frequently in practice when collaborating with others and helping them to develop anonymization processes that we do it on an artificially generated data and then hand over the anonymization process and it's then executed on the um, original data set. Um, Third question I would like to answer is, uh, isn't replicability desired for data and the results to be verifiable? Yes, of course. Um, I was referring with the replicability property um, to the replicability of, of certain variables in relationship um, to the individuals that uh, this information refers to, right? And some information can be very uh, replicable, like let's say um, your date of birth, it's, uh, probably a relatively replicable property, but if you take certain types of blood tests, for example, then the results will vary, right? So you won't be able to necessarily replicate the specific piece of information um, in the future. The overall data set, um, of course, sure, should be possible to replicate results based on the anonymous data set. The next question I would like to answer is, would you say that anonymization should always involve some qualitative or manual evaluation in addition to quantitative approaches? Should we always start with a quantitative analysis of the data to understand our uh, qualitative analysis of the data to understand our data sets better? That is a very good question. And um, my answer is yes. I think that it's very challenging um, in almost all cases to anonymize a data set without some qualitative um, decisions to be made. So if you really stick to the very formal methods um, and want to thoroughly protect a data set that will usually result in, uh, in a data set that has a very low utility. So you have to make some assumptions or of course, referring back to the five safes framework, share your data under certain conditions and in certain uh, settings, but let's focus on the data for now, then really just following um, 
quantitative methods will usually not be sufficient, but some assumptions have to be made or some qualitative assessments have to be made of, um, of potential risks that there are to your data set um, so that you can really optimize the process. And this leads me to another recommendation. I think one very important aspect of anonymization is documentation. So you should clearly document the decisions that you have made, the assumptions that you have made, the results of your qualitative assessment of your data set and of the potential risks that you are seeing um, to really make it transparent and understandable for others how specifically a data set has been protected and also uh, to clearly um, demonstrate or describe why the data set has been protected the way it has been protected. The next question that I would like to answer is uh, what about unstructured data? For example, images, is there a standard in this case? Um, the answer is it depends on the type of data. Generally uh, speaking, um, Imaging data, for example, can be more challenging to anonymize than tabular data. Generally, let's say formal anonymization becomes the more complex and the more difficult to do, the higher the dimensionality of your data is. And if you take, for example, an image, it's usually um, a, a, an information asset that contains a lot of information. So this also means that other types of methods have to be applied. So masking to pick up the term that has just been mentioned in one of the questions masking out parts of an image is a common way of anonymizing an image but it still might leave some information within the image and um, concepts that are usually used to protect tabular data like for example reasoning about the distinguishability um, of of the information about different people or how unique pieces of information about a different about different people um, is, is something that does not apply to images because basically every Every image is different from any other image. There's not a lot that you can do to, um, to prevent this. So this means that potentially the residual risks can be higher, but it really also depends on the context. So if you have various, I don't know, various types of x-rays um, that, that have been checked by um, by physicians for whether they contain any anything specific and all the, the identifying metadata or um, burnt in annotations have been removed from an image, for example, um, then it's also something, again, um, requiring a qualitative assessment to be made um, where often a very high degree of protection and uh, can be assumed, but this really, this decision has to be made on a on a case by case basis, um, and it really depends on on the specific images, um, what can be done and how protected the result uh, can can be assumed to be. The next question that I would like to um, and that I would like to um, answer is at what point do you recommend researchers to hire a data protection specialist versus using a self-service tool? So I must say that I would generally suggest it doesn't necessarily need to be a hire, um, but to work together with someone that is a specialist in protecting data, because this can be quite challenging um, as probably has become also obvious from, from previous workshops in the series and also from today. There's a lot of aspects that need to be considered if you have a very, um, if you have a very, very narrow data set um, also, which is not too sensitive, um, you can think about uh, doing it yourself, but I would always suggest to at least have someone like your DPO, like some other type of support structure that you might have on your institution with uh, expertise in privacy protection um, to, to, to talk to them and uh, to reassure that, uh, that what you did to protect the data set is reasonable. The next question I would like to uh, to, to like to answer is uh, how should one reference ARX in a protocol or a manuscript? Is there a, re a preference? Um, we generally prefer to be uh, to have one of our papers cited. There's like uh, two index publications, one from 2014 and one from I think 2021, um, where we have sort of described the current state of development, and we generally um, prefer to be uh, to 
um, refer that ARX is being referenced to by using a reference to one of our publications. Um, but we also, for example, have a website in case um, this should be more reasonable in a certain context. The next question I would like to ask is, is, um, is masking data synonymous to mocking data? I think that's already a, a reply to, to uh, like a follow-up question. Um, I think I will do follow-up questions later, um, but let me quickly answer that one. It really depends, as I said, on what you understand under the term masking. There are different, um, different meanings that people associate to the term. One common meaning is that masking is a synonym to mocking data, but it's not the only meaning that the term can have. And um, no, this is not something that ARX can do. ARX is uh, focused on transforming a data set to fulfill certain uh, protection guarantees and has not been designed to generate um, mock data there are other tools that are better in doing this um, than ARX. Then final question before I do the practical exercises. Um, the question is, the gender is getting more complicated as more of us are choosing non-binary gender identities. In certain locations, this variable could be re-identifiable. That's um, absolutely correct. It is becoming more, more difficult and more complicated. Um, still, I would argue that for, for many gender identities, identifiability is, um, is relatively, or distinguishability is relatively low. But of course, as I mentioned, this has to be made on a case-by-case -case basis. It was just an example um, within my slide set. And of course, it always depends on the, um, on the values that a variable can take. If it's a simple binary uh, variable, then even then, it might be the case that uh, one of the two binary outcomes applies to a wide range of the respondents and the other one is a very rare pro property. So making this decision always also involves uh, taking a look at the specific values that a variable can get. And um, potentially, it might also be necessary if some of the values that a variable can take are sensitive and others aren't to uh, split the variable up into multiple variables, one variable containing the less sensitive and the other one containing the more sensitive values so that they can be treated independently um, when anonymizing a data set. And then I see there's one more question that referred to the first part. I, I would like to answer that one as well. Um, who, what are the types of adversaries we should be concerned about? This is very vague. I need more concrete examples. Um, this is also a good question. This is really uh, context dependent, I must say. That there's no general uh, answer to this question. I, I mentioned uh, a few sort of examples that are being used in the literature to model various types of risks, right? An adversary that is interested in doing marketing or an adversary that is interested in Let's say let's uh, let's say somebody from the police who tries to find out uh, something about a very specific subject or a journalist. Um, but in, in, for example, in the domain where I work, when data is being uh, shared in in health context, then you can also distinguish between um, between a recipient that works within the healthcare context and a recipient that doesn't. Um, you can distinguish between someone. Um, who might be interested in finding something out about their neighbor um, versus somebody who isn't really interested in finding out anything. So that really comes down to your um, specific qualitative assessment. Um, I uh, understand that this might not be a very fulfilling answer, but it really depends on your specific decisions that you make. and. Um, there is, to my knowledge, there is not really, um, let's say something like, again, a catalog of common types of adversaries that you might want to consider um, apart from the ones that I also mentioned um, in my presentation. <clears throat> okay, I think all further questions are follow-up questions. Um, which means we're through with, with this Q&A block, and I will then proceed to do the practical um, exercises. Let me quickly switch to the software. So this is ARX, and um, what I will now do in the next couple of minutes, I will um, try to, to replicate a few of the things that I have talked about using a data set that is uh, 
quite similar to the example that I also had in my presentation. So it's a synthetic uh, data set with very basic pieces of information um, about um, individuals suffering from, from COVID-19. We could, for example, um, we could, for example, assume that this is sort of a data set has been published by a COVID-19 registry uh, to foster scientific collaboration, to allow people to get an idea of the types of information that are um, contained in the registry. And let us assume that we want to protect this data set from, um, from privacy breaches. And um, the first thing that I will do in ARX, so this is how ARX looks when, when you just open the software. There's not a lot that you can do. Mostly, most of it is deactivated. And the first thing um, to get started in ARX is that we need to create a project. And I will create a very simple project here, um, giving it a name and a description. This will make a few more options available in the software. And the most important option is that we are now able to import a data set, which we so we, we sort of um, usually have the, the arrangement that there is, of course, a menu, as you might uh, know from, from sort of most usual types of desktop applications, as ARX is one as well. Uh, there is a menu here, but there's also a menu bar providing you with a shortcut of a few um, of the function to a few of the functionalities that the software has. Uh, here are the four perspectives that I mentioned. You can see they're all empty at the moment because there is no um, data set loaded. And um, the first thing we need to do is we need to load a data set. We can see that there's options to import data from Excel files. We can import data from relational database management systems, but we can also import data from CSV files, which is what I will do in this case. Um, then I sort of select my file and um, then you can see that ARX already tries to to, to help you a bit by detecting various properties of the file that you selected. So what the specific delimiters are that are being used in your data set, whether or not there are column names included. And um, here you can see sort of a preview of your data set and helps you to understand whether everything has been detected correctly. If not, you're able to change those settings here. And when you're reassured that everything is fine, you can click next. And um, now you're able to select data types. And again, um, ARX will try its best to de automatically detect data types. So here we can see that age of diagnosis has been detected to be an integer, the date of diagnosis has been detected to be a date in a certain format, and that the rest um, uh, has been detected to be a string slash a categorical uh, variable. And actually, this is quite important here that you that you make sure that the data types are um, captured adequately because this then also allows you you can see here by the check mark to perform um, some data cleansing tasks um, because it's important for ARX to know which values in your data set adhere to the data type and which variable values of your data set um, don't which will then be replaced by missings which again um, will be handled specially within software. So then we can click next. Again, there is a preview. We can check whether everything is right. We click finish. And now we have imported our um, data set into the software. Now we can see that here in the configuration perspective on the left-hand side, uh, we are provided with an overview um, of the data set. Um, the same should be the case. Let me see in the other in other perspectives, yes, we can see here that in the risk analysis and utility analysis perspective, we are now also have the left um, side of the application um, providing us with some context, in this case, the original data set, because as I mentioned, ARX is uh, always designed in the uh, utility and uh, risk analysis perspective to provide you sort of with a comparison between input and output data. And um, we can see here in the distribution um, or in the distribution of age of diagnosis, for example, if we, if we click on this, and generally speaking, you can also see here in the top right corner, the selected variable. So whenever you click on something, you see that there's sort of one selected variable within the software. And for example, here with the date of diagnosis, we can also see uh, sort of the waves of uh, people getting infected um, with uh, COVID-19 over time. There's also an insurance number, um, which of course is uh, clearly an identifying variable that we would not like to share with anyone. And um, I will just very quickly, um, let's assume this is now our data set. I will very quickly switch to 
uh, an Excel file that I have prepared um, with a risk assessment. Um, I think that's quite similar to what I also already showed in the um, in the presentation. You can see here that I um, studied sort of the replicability, availability, and distinguishability of the variables within my data set. I made a qualitative assessment, and I came to the decision that there's four variables that are associated with a particularly high risk of re-identification, which are these three. There's also another variable that I um, that I marked, which is the last known patient status, because this is information that we might want to protect from um, attribute inference, making sure that it's not possible, even if there's no direct form of um, of linkage to the data set, we would potentially want to ensure that it's um, hard for adversaries to refer the last known patient status um, for individuals. And we can now uh, go back into our software. I mentioned that there is this configuration perspective that helps us with specifying information um, about the data set and the types of protection that we would like to achieve. Um, I will quickly introduce this uh, perspective. You can see, as I already I highlighted the data set on the left-hand side. There's a larger panel here on the top right, which is used to specify information about the individual variables. There's a um, there's an area down here, which we'll use later because this can be used to, um, um, to consider population characteristics when anonymizing a data set. Um, down here, there's a panel that is considered with various aspects in regards to the utility of the data set and also what can be done when transforming um, the data. And here is where we specify um, the privacy guarantees that we would like our output data set to have. And um, we, we just saw that we particularly would like to protect those for as a result of our risk assessment, um, the decision that we could make uh, could be to protect um, those four variables here. The insurance number is clearly a direct identifier, so we can mark this as identifying. See now that it has a red dot, um, and this will mean uh, all information that is marked as identifying in ARX will generally be removed as part of the anonymization process. Um, which leaves us with three additional variables, which are also, um, again, if we consider the usual guidelines uh, on anonymization, also form a typical quasi-identifying variable, um, at least the age and sex part, but might, of course, also um, apply in this case to date of diagnosis, which we have determined is also something, as it's a very specific point in time, it's also something that is usually considered to be associated with a high degree um, of identifiability. And um, so let's mark these three variables as quasi-identifying, which basically means, yes, there we see that there is clearly a, a risk of uh, re-identification or privacy breaches associated with those variables. But at the same time, we cannot simply delete those variables because they might be needed for, for downstream analyses. And um, this means that now we would like to apply some degree of protection um, to this data set. Uh, sorry, to those variables. Maybe one tab that I would also like to show is the attribute metadata that you can see up here. Uh, you see it basically summarizes what we did so far. So here's all the variables. You can see the data type, the format, and um, I will come back at, at this year later. Um, you can also see that yeah, the data types are, are, are marked here, and this is important now when we think about what could be done to those variables. And um, one common way um, of transforming data sets is by having basically rules of transformations that can be applied. And one common rule is like specifying a domain generalization hierarchy, um, which would basically consist of a tree structure where the values uh, that you have within your variable become increasingly less specific. This is sort of the backbone of how data is transformed in ARX. Um, although it is not the only thing that ARX can do to those variables, um, it's always a good idea to have such hierarchy specified because ARX will then, for example, use this information to also determine which values are close to each other or not, right? Which various are, are, are comparable to calculate distances and similarities between uh, the individual values of certain variables and their combinations. So it's always a good idea to have such hierarchy specified. And um, we will do this here. Let's start with the age uh, with the age of diagnosis. I select the variable. I can then go either through edit, uh, create hierarchy, 
or I can also click here on this uh, hierarchy symbol. And now we can see that there's a range of wizards included in ARX that help us to specify um, the specify different ways of transformation. And I can maybe just to quickly show you an example, uh, let us try um, masking. Let's see, you just click uh, masking, keep all the default settings. And you see that this has now been, um, so that this is a mechanism that sort of removes digits from right to left. So that would be one very simple way that we could use to generalize this variable, but not really optimal. What is better in this case, because we have a numeric variables is, is that we can use intervals to do that. And there's also an editor included here for specifying those intervals. Generally, um, we, we need first need to specify a range that the variable can take. This is also a, a very versatile mechanism if you have continuous data. And this is now an integer value, but it works equally um, well for, for continuous variables. And um, now we specify basically a base interval. Let's do this by saying everything from zero to 10 and can then add additional levels. We add a new level and in each level, we can now specify how many of the previous intervals we would like to group. So in this case, we could group uh, two intervals. So it gives us first from zero to 10 and then from zero to 20. And all the other intervals that are missing here to cover the complete domain of the variable are automatically repeated to, to cover this whole thing. And that's um, particularly important for if you have very large, uh, very large domains or you have continuous variables that it doesn't require you to explicitly specify the rule you want to apply to each and every possible value, but the pattern that you specify will be replicated. But it doesn't necessarily need to be, um, it doesn't necessarily need to be, um, how do you say, uh, um, uh, uniform, let's say uniform, but, but you can have different factors here. So for example, um, if you remove this, I can say right click at after, which allows me to introduce an additional grouping within the same hierarchy level. And um, now I could, for example, choose a size of three. So this would now give me zero to 20, then 20 to 50. And then I could add after this, for example, well, let us do four and I could after I could do after this again, and two. So now that's a bit bit less regular and it gives us a flexibility in how specifically we want and the values of the variable to be grouped. It's common to do this, for example, like in the medical field where I come from to do this for age, for example, and because usually there's like you have the younger people, then, then you have like a larger portion in the middle, and then you're more interested in people that are specifically old, for example. So it's not necessarily a good idea to have uniform group sizes within the hierarchy that you specify. And then again, we can click on next. And now we see we have a hierarchy spe um, specified using intervals. Um, but there is a range of additional things that can be done. Let us click on uh, sex for the moment. Uh, here, um, we could uh, sort of create a hierarchy, but it's very simple in this case by, by just using a set. So this is sort of here, it says ordering um, for variables. So this basically means that you, you specify a certain order of the variable and can then again use groupings to create different sets of values <clears throat> that are semantically similar to each other. In this case, there's not so much we can do, but just for demonstration purposes, we can create a set that com cont contains both of these values. There's a range of additional options that you usually have. So here, for example, different aggregate functions, different so that it's not necessarily the set. Uh, right here, we really see each of the two values. Um, we also could have constant value applied. Let me show this for a second. If we say constant value, um, and we could just add the star. Now we have the star as the, um, as the label for this category um, and so forth. So let us add uh, this category. And finally, here we also have a date. Again, there's a specific visual visit included for dates. Um, I can click here on date and then say, okay, let us first go by month and year, then by quarter and year, and finally by year. And I click next and we see that this is the generalization we have here, right? The concrete date, the month, Order and finally only the year. And now we have different um, different uh, options within the software for reducing the granularity or the fidelity of the information that is included in the data set. And this can of course help uh, or be used by the software to reduce the uniqueness of the data that, um, that we are seeing.
Um, maybe uh, one additional comment here. I now use the built-in functionalities by ARX to create those rules, but as you can see, the rules are represented as, uh, as tables, basically. So this means you can also specify rules in a separate software. If you have a very specific rule, you can do it in Excel and then just have the Excel sheet imported here as a rule for transforming the data for simple edits. There's also, as you can see here, an editor included where you can then also manually change um, the, the yeah, the, the specifics the specifics of the rule. However, this is of course a bit limited. So should you really want to do a lot of manual editing, suggest to do it in, in an external um, software package. So um, now we have specified transformation rules for, for those variables. Um, and let me finally specify some, some privacy um, guarantees that we would like to achieve. And let's start simple with K-anonymity, which has already been introduced in the previous workshop and also quickly in my example. And I will take K equals 11 here. Um, maybe a comment on thresholds. That is one relatively common threshold. There are a few common thresholds, um, but 11 is a common threshold because it corresponds to uh, 0 0.09. And um, 0 0.09 is a risk thre threshold that has been mentioned in a few, um, in a few guidelines. So it's a common choice, but also five would be a common choice. Three can be a common choice. Depends a bit on, on your data, how large it is. And we can see here that this is a, depending on your perspective, either relatively small or relatively large data set, um, but at least it has uh, around uh, 10,000 entries. So now I've specified that I would like to uh, have K-anonymity um, satisfied for the variables that I have uh, selected as quasi-identifiers. What I also always recommend to do is to move this slider to 100%. This is the suppression limit. This basically allows the software to drop records from a data set. And here you can specify a limit on how many records can be dropped. From time to time, that might be something that you really want to do because you know that there's really only a small number of records that I'm um, that I am allowed to use and lose as part of the anonymization process. However, ARX is usually pretty good in balancing what is being done to the variables itself versus dropping records. So it's never a bad idea to to, to simply have it selected or configured as up to 100% because usually the number of records that are being dropped. Um, at least if there's like a good solution to your anonymization problem will be pretty low um, anyways. So I will just start with 100%. And um, that's basically already it. And now we can use this to run the uh, internal optimization um, processes that ARX can do. And you see when you was a bit quick. There's this check mark here, but you can also do edit anonymize. And when you do that, there is a range of options that you can use to influence a bit what ARX, uh, what the optimization algorithms in ARX will actually do. But it's usually not a bad idea to stick with the default settings. And um, in this case, we will stick with the default settings. We see that this is done very, very quickly. And we now have an anonymized um, data set that we can take a closer look at. And um, and we'll do this by, by switching here to, to the utility analysis tab. So now we can see by selecting agent diagnosis that this more granular age information has been replaced by intervals. Um, so it's the, we can also see this up here, but I will show more in the exploration perspective where this even becomes a bit more, um, more intuitive to see um, that the sort of first generalization level has been applied to age, no generalization has applied, been applied to sex and, and the generalization level two. So that means mapping to quarters has been applied to the date of diagnosis. And this uh, becomes obvious here in the distribution, right? We see, um, we see this, uh, less fidelity in age of diagnosis. We see that a few variable, a few values uh, have been removed in regards to sex and that uh, the date of diagnosis has been mapped to the quarters. Um, we can also take a look at summary statistics. This can also all be, all be moved up and down and see here what has happened. And of course, the scale of measure has changed of the variables here like from a ratio scale to an audio scale for for the for for the age, for example, and but still some sort of important parameters of the distribution have been preserved. We take a look at, for example, at the maximum, or we take a look at the the minimum. We can see that um, that this is consistent, and um, 
And what we can also see is the number of records that ARX, ARX has actually removed from the data set as part of the anonymization process. And this is, you can see here, 191 records. So this is available through the class size, um, class size tab here, um, 119 records, which amounts to about 1.19 uh, rounded percent of the records that have been removed, so a relatively small number, and all the other records have been preserved. What you can also do is you can um, sort of uh, scroll through the data set. You can see that this is synchronized from, from left to right, so you will always be able to see what has happened to a specific record um, in your data set um, by comparing the left and the right side of the um, of, of this of this view by comparing the left and the, the right side of uh, of the data sets so left the input and the output data set sorry and um what you can also see here is um, some information on uh, data quality models that have been calculated excuse me this is a bit small i deliberately uh, reduced my screen resolution so that you can see a little bit better and can see here the number of missings, for example, for the individual rec uh, variables, it's also those 1.187. And then the result of some models that have been suggested for capturing uh, the reduction in utility. One that is relatively intuitive is this granularity measure, which sort of gives you an idea of the degree or the amount of fidelity that has been lost in the variables that have been transformed, um, which here amounts to roughly 11.5% uh, reduction um, in fidelity. We can also take a look at the risk perspective and see what has been what has happened to the data set in terms of uh, re-identification um, risks. And here is one a comparison. Again, left is input data set, right um, is the output data set, where we can see that in the original data set, or this is um, sort of blue is the records down here, the fraction of records that have a certain risk. The risk is on the x-axis and the percentage of the records is on the y-axis. And we can see that there are records that have uh, quite quite, uh, quite some high risk. They're actually, most of the records have a risk um, of above 50 percent so it's, they're basically unique and that's um, in this case about 75 percent of the records in the data set that have originally been unique and while in the new data set there are no unique records at all but there's a cluster of risk that is around a risk of one two three percent so quite a, a low degree of uniqueness and um, this is expressed as a risk here, which basically stands for the likelihood that if an adversary would basically randomly assign an individual to an individual within the group that the individual now falls into, um, that, um, that this uh, random association is basically correct. And we do also see the risk threshold here. I mentioned we had uh, a 0 0.09 as a risk threshold applied here, which is also indicated by this black line. So all risks should be below this black uh, yeah, black threshold here, which is the case. But we also see that what happened is some form of overprotection, right? So most of uh, the records now actually have a risk that is significantly smaller than the risk threshold that we specified. And um, we could potentially, and we'll do this in a second, optimize the utility here. Um, a bit which at the same time would probably push risks more towards um, the threshold um, side of things. There's also a view um, where we where we can um, have selected sort of, um, so we basically now have the distribution of risks here. Now we can take a look at specific um, parameters of this distribution. And this can be done in this in this specific perspective, where you're also able to, to specify a specific risk threshold that you would like to take a look at. So um, here we have a risk threshold of 20% specified. And um, we see that in the original data set, almost all records had a risk that is higher, was higher than 20%. To 20% the highest risk was 100%, so it's really like unique records. And if an adversary would have randomly assigned individuals to matching records, then the success rate would have been about 87%. And now in the protected data set, we can see that no records do have a risk um, of 20 or more, uh, 20 or more percent, um, that the highest risk in the data set is 9.09. So exactly as I mentioned, it corresponds to the 11 in k-anonymity. 
um, with k equals 11. And um, the success rate has also dropped significantly. We see the three models that I presented here. And what we can also see is that there's basically no difference between what we are seeing for the prosecutor and the journalist model. This has to do with the fact that we are not able to estimate journalist risks better in this case, because that would require us um, to have some information about the likelihood that an adversary knows that an individual is already contained in the data set. So recap, in the prosecutor scenario, we assume the adversary knows that the individual is, uh, in, is reflected in the data set. And in the journalist case, we don't make that assumption. So we would need some information about, um, about yeah, this specific uh, about the knowledge of the adversary or the risk that there would be or the likelihood that an adversary could infer membership, um, which is information that we don't have at the moment. But it's, that is information that we do have if we have some population information available. And we will, and I will show how this um, works in a second. Um, there are a few additional tabs. Um, I won't go into all the details. Um, but here, for example, again, there's a collection of various types of risk estimates that are derived from the, from the distribution and from other models that are being executed in the background. Um, there's also models that you could use to estimate population uniqueness based on some statistical, um, st statistical approaches that have been suggested in the literature always, and that's important under the assumption that the data set that you're having is a random sample from the overall population um, to get estimates here. You can go back to the configuration perspective. There's the population settings that you have here. So you can specify the population from which this has been sampled with which sampling fraction, and then the models that are being executed here would uh, sort of yeah, give you an appropriate, just appropriate result. But as I mentioned, always under the assumption um, that this is a, a random sample that you're studying, which not might not always um, be the case. Also here on the um, utility analysis side, maybe one additional feature that I can show is I mentioned that there's some um, classification tasks that you can run within the software to also study the relationships between variables. There's also simple um, methods here to, to capture relationships in the form of contingency tables. I can quickly show that if you click on contingency and then click on two variables, you can see a contingency table. Um, you can also, and how this has been coarsened in this case by the um, anonymization processes that we have applied, um, but you can also specifically study the relationship in this, between selected variables and a certain target variable. Fortunately, I have the, see the zoom bar is in the way of where I want to click. So I click here. So let's assume we would like to estimate the last known patient status from the three quasi-identifying variables that we have. And you can see here, um, in this case, by a range of models that you can use. That's a very simple logistic regression. And we can see that, um, that uh, there's some predictive uh, power, which sort of makes sense because in particular, uh, as we all know, elder people, um, are likely to have worse outcome in regards to COVID-19. So, so there are some estimations that we can make. And we see here that in terms of utility in the transformed data set, there is not really an impact on the um, predictive power that we have. So sort of the relationship um, between those three quasi-identifying variables and the outcome variable in this case has been preserved as part of the anonymization process. So. Let me now go back and um, let me quickly demonstrate a few of the more, more advanced um, settings of the software, the more, more advanced options that we have. Um, let me see this and this. Um, so now, just, just to quickly demonstrate, there, there's a few additional things that we can do. Um, for example, I mentioned that, um, that generalization is not, not the only thing that can be done through um, the software can, for example, also say that we want to apply an aggregation um, to numerical uh, variables. In this case, the hierarchy will just be um, used to cluster the values, but not to derive the final result. And the final result will, in this case, be derived as an arithmetic mean within a certain group of indistinguishable um, individuals. 
Um, let me quickly execute this. And then we can see that now the data type basically has been preserved, but of course, this is now a non-truthful type of transformation that has been done to the variable. So it really introduces error and what the reduction of the fidelity um, doesn't do. There's also the option for us to um, apply different types of generalization. So let me go back to generalization for a second. Um, now we um, we can see here that what has been done, um, and I mentioned this, is that there is this um, information on a specific level that has been applied, and here this has been generalized to level one. Um, so all values of this variable have been generalized to level one, but we could also use a local generalization scheme where different generalization levels um, have been used um, for different records. And let me also quickly show that. Um, we do this by um, when we click the anonymization button and we click on local transformation and then we can click this and now this apply allows ARX to use sort of have more freedom when transforming the data and we can now see that um, within the data set some age values have been preserved as is others have been replaced by values or by intervals of length 10 um, and this can help, for example, to, to preserve more fidelity. We should now also, let me go back and check, um, see this in the risk distribution. So at least we can see it's a little bit closer uh, to where um, we wanted it to be, still not perfect. Um, but at the same time, um, of course, this is also now a data set that is much more challenging uh, to, to analyze. We can see here if we just have the sort of uh, the empirical categorical distribution that this is now, of course, uh, not uh, not do you say uh, not representative of the actual distribution anymore. It needs to be considered that you have different granularities of the different age values in your data set, um, which can be challenging. Um, let me and anonymize this again with the global setting. Um, one thing that I wanted to show, but I did not show yet is the exploration perspective. So ARX will automatically select a solution for you that the software thinks is, is good. It does that depending on the utility measure that has been selected down here. So you can see that there is a range of models that can be used. This is one of the sort of uh, objective functions of the anonymization process or the optimization process that the software executes. Uh, loss is like a very, again, a very uh, intuitive and simple measure, which basically captures the granularity of the data. So I mentioned this before in the utility analysis perspective. Um, but um, the solution that ARX has selected might not necessarily be the one um, that you that you want or that you think is necessary for your case. And in this case, there's this exploration perspective where it provides you with alternative um, solutions. In this case, as we did a global transformation, it's just the potential combinations of the generalization level of, of the variables um, that are options here. There are different ways of visualizing this. You can also visualize this as a list where you will have here some graphical indicator of how good the software thinks that the utility of the specific transformation is. We can also see that there are a few uh, transformations that are um, all um, ranked to have very high utility or, or very good utility according to this loss model that we have specified. There's two that are very similar to each other and we can see that they are very similar in each other um, through this uh, through this tooltip here that in, in the one that we have selected now, that's the, the yellow one, uh, we have a date of diagnosis generalized to, uh, to level two of three, but also using uh, level one here um, for date of diagnosis would give us a data set which ARX thinks is almost equally as good. Um, and we can do this by just right clicking here on the transformation and then uh, select apply transformation and now we will have this data set where it's level two that has been used on the date of diagnosis. Now we can see that this is month and year and not a quarter and year anymore. And this must now have had an impact on the, on the number of records that have been removed. And we can see that this is now 511 as opposed to 119 um, that we had removed before. So this basically trades off the granularity of the date 
um, of diagnosis information versus the number of records that um, can be um, or that have been um, preserved. Now, what I also wanted uh, to show is um, that we can consider population uh, information. Again, unfortunately, the Zoom bar is in the way. I need to quickly bring this up. And we can do this down here. Um, there's different ways for you to specify, should you have a subset of a larger data set that you want to anonymize, then you can load the larger data set as well as the subset, and then use information on the relationship between those two um, data sets to, um, to have a more a clearer risks, a clearer um, view of the risks, and to further optimize the anonymization process. And there's different ways in which this can be done. Um, you can load the overall data set and then load another data set to have them matched within the software. If it's just a, a set of the individuals with certain characteristics, then there's also an integrated query engine where you could, for example, say, um, now um, I have a data set on, uh, on all the on all, uh, on all the males in my data set. So then I select male and it will select all the males as your data set. Or you can also, and I will do this um, now, for demonstration purposes, basically just do um, a random sample. As I said, it's also a typical or a common way of, um, of protecting a data set. So let us take a 20% random sample and let's assume that the random sample is the data set that we want to anonymize and publish. Um, and we can see here that uh, the which data is included in the random sample is indicated here in these checkboxes. So it's around 20% that have now been randomly um, selected. And um, let us still uh, stick with 11 anonymity and let us just anonymize this data set using the same process as before. Um, this will now, of course, give us a different data set because it only considers those 20% that we have selected when, uh, when enforcing 11 anonymity. Um, but what this now does is it gives us more information here in the, um, in the um, this attacker model's perspective because we can now see that we see differences between the risks that are being shown for the prosecutor and the journalist scenario because ARX can now use information about the relationship between the larger data set and the smaller data set to estimate um, the, the, the likelihood with which an adversary can determine the membership of individuals, which is a prerequisite to doing a re-identification under the journalist attacker model. And um, and we can also use this directly protect the data set to protect the data set by not using the canonymity model anymore, but we can now use the KMAP model, which basically says we want also um, we want the size of groups of indistinguishable records to be at least 11, but not within the 20%, but for each record that is in the 20% within the overall data set. And this considers now this additional um, aspect of, um, of the adversary needing to determine membership to perform re-identification under the journalist model. And this, we can already see it here in the applied generalization levels, will give us a data set with, to which uh, sort of which has been uh, generalized or in which uh, less or there's a higher fidelity now while um, applying or while while um, basically keeping the same or uh, uh, sorry excuse me and uh, while, while sort of sticking to the same um, threshold um, which um, is now also reflected here because you can see the highest risk in the data set only looking at those 20 percent is now 100% because there are unique records in there. But if you consider that they're actually a sample from a larger population, then within this population, they are all indistinguishable from at least 10 others fulfilling 11 anonymity, which again gives us this uh, highest risk of 9.09. And um, there's a range of advanced uh, things that can be done here. Um, there's also the option to use those population uniqueness models should you have a random sample um, directly when anonymizing the data set. So instead of using KMAP here, I could also select um, population uniqueness and have a certain threshold specified. Then also this will be considered during the anonymization process. We can also protect data from attribute disclosure. Um, let us maybe quickly stick to this example um, where there's 
and the last known um, patient status as a variable that we want uh, to protect from being exposed or um, inferable by an adversary, then we can specify that this is a sensitive variable and um, also are able to and now also required to specify how we want to protect this variable. And one model that has been also introduced in the last workshop, as far as I know, is L diversity. So we could now say, and again, there's you can see different versions of this model included in ARX. Um, and we can now select it that we want L diversity to apply to this variable. And we can combine this with K anonymity, but as I said, it's not necessarily required. And many other applications that have similar goals, you have to um, you have to combine this with each other. In this specific case, it's not necessary. Now we only um, protect the data set from from adversaries being able to infer this information in every group of indistinguishable records there now will be at least three different and uh, distinct um three different distinct outputs um there's no protection from re-identification in this case and um, we can just switch over and let's uh, do this this classification thing here again it's unfortunate that zoom is in the way um well, what we can also see is that this has, hasn't actually changed a lot, right? And this has to do with the fact that uh, L diversity um, doesn't say anything about the distribution that a variable might have within a group of indistinguishable records. So blue, black is here with the anonymized data and red is sort of the curve uh, with the original data. We see there's not really a big difference. Um, because L diversity is a relatively weak model. There's just, you know, that there's at least three different values within each group of indistinguishable individuals. But if 99% of them have value A and only very few have value B, then there's still some predictive um, power out of this. It's very likely that the individual that you want to learn something about has um, the more frequent characteristic, and that's something that is not prevented by this model for this, you would then need to go on to use T-closeness, which is also supported within the software um, that plays a stronger restrictions on the distribution um, of the values within the sensitive variable. However, this will then usually also have quite a significant impact on the utility of the output data. Um, but again, we can, we can also add uh, canonymity to this. Maybe let's go back to working with the whole data set and not just with the 20% sample. So now you also have an example where um, a few of a few models have been combined. And um, the last thing that I would like to show, um, just so that you have seen it quickly, uh, is our support um, for differential privacy. I mentioned that this is quite a, quite a strong model, which um, due to its quite rigorous uh, mathematical guarantees is considered to be the gold standard by many, but at the same time, usually has quite an impact on the usefulness of data. There's also a version implemented here. To do this, I will uh, first um, mark every variable as being identifying so um, that we can really focus on the variables that we want to have included in our differentially private release. And for this to, to, to work, I will just select the three quasi-identifying variables at the moment. Um, because here it's important when you apply this technique that all variables, um, so that all variables that will be included in the output are also quasi-identifiers. Well, if you don't do this, then you leak some, might potentially leak some information and um, the differential privacy property that you um, think uh, would be, uh, would apply to your data set or apply to the process with which the data set has been generated and does not actually hold. So um, uh, you see, I can select differential privacy. There's a few parameters here. I will change them a little bit and then just execute this. And now you have a data set that has been protected using the differential privacy um, model. Um, and you can also see that this does have quite some impact on the utility of the data. We have quite a, a low fidelity for the variables that remain and probably also have quite some variables. Let me expand this and um, remove from the data set. Um, yes, you can see 22%. So it's a very narrow data set now consisting of only three variables. Everything else has been removed and 22% uh, of the records have also been removed. However, this is a data set which has very, been very strongly protected and um, sort of gives you an idea of, of the trade-offs involved uh, when using very 
rigorous mathematical models for protecting privacy. With that said, I think I will conclude my walkthrough through um, through ARX. Oh, one minor thing. You might have recognized that there is a question mark in the top right of almost all the views that you can see. That's an integrated context-specific help, uh, which sort of guides you through the process and explains a bit more um, about what the different options in the software do. And um, yeah, whenever you are in a certain region or, uh, or a certain area of the software and not sure what to do, always makes sense to click this button and you will be provided with some additional information uh, that hopefully helps you to understand the options that are being offered. And I will now very quickly, so that we have time also still for the Q&A, uh, jump back to my presentation. That was the practical exercises for different parts. And um, I would like to recommend uh, to, to recommend some readings. There are two articles, um, of course, the specific to ARX. There's other articles as well that describe how data has been anonymized. Here are two articles, one by my group, one by another group that describe in a relatively detailed manner um, how ARX has been used to and anonymize um, concrete uh, real-world data sets. There are also two books that I would like to uh, to suggest should you be interested in delving deeper in the topic and understanding the various concepts, also getting an idea about which of the many concepts, concepts that you might find in the literature are sort of more relevant for practical applications um, than others. And um, what I would also like to do is to recommend or suggest one other tool, uh, SDC Micro, also quite a well-known um, and uh, successful tool for anonymizing data that is implement, integrated into the R statistics computing environment. It also has um, a graphical front end. It's a bit more on the statistical side of things. It offers a few, um, quite a lot more methods that are non-truthful, so perturbative approaches to changing data. But really, if you um, if you ask me, what sort of the 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 sort of practical applications are that I would really suggest to use uh, for for real world anonymization processes, and then STC Micro is clearly something that you also um, should take a look at. And with that. We are coming to the final questions and answers session. And I will try to go through as many as possible, as many as I can. So the first question is uh, what I think about um, uh, about commercial comp companies that offer proprietary anonymization solutions that are not open source, um, uh, whether um, some of them are more serious or uh, serious or good in, uh, than others. And so I must clearly say that there are commercial products that that offer quite nice and comprehensive anonymization functionalities. Um, so I don't think there's uh, generally a reason to avoid commercial providers in the space. I still suggest, um, as I did with anonymization concepts in general, um, to, to have a privacy specialist involved in selecting a product because there's also a lot of commercial products um, that um, are actually quite simple and um, or have other sort of downsides to them. So what I want to say is you should really understand what methods are provided by the software and what methods aren't, um, but there are good products um, out there anyway. Would the data set be shared with the audience? Um, the slides will clearly be shared on the website. Should you be interested in a data set, I, I have to check. Um, feel free to, for example, write me a mail and I will provide you with additional information. Then there is a question when the appropriate time is to use this tool before a study begins or as it progresses. Um, this tool should clearly be used when only be used when you need to share data with others while providing privacy protection guarantees. Um, and um, this usually works best the more data you have. And usually you come to a dissemination stage after you have collected data within studies. So it's more something that comes later in the dissemination phase, um, also um, the collaboration phase. Um, and uh, it's usually not necessarily used while a study is ongoing or at the very beginning. The next question is, what determines what is suppressed? 
Um, what determines what is suppressed? Uh, the answer is it's the algorithms within ARX. So I, I showed that in the bottom right, there's this perspective where you can select utility models. And there's also this, this, or this area where you can select utility models or usefulness models. And then there's this area where you can select privacy models. And ARX automatically executes uh, optimization algorithms that try to transform the data based on the configuration options that you have specified and to find an optimal or to maximize the utility of the of the data set according to the model while applying all possible transformations that can be done based on what you have specified and this algorithm also optimally trades off for example reducing the fidelity of certain variables versus suppressing or dropping specific records you can also use ARX, I didn't show this, um, but if you run a local transformation process with a generalization rule that just allows a variable to be dropped, then you can, for example, also apply cell suppression using ARX, which means you anonymize the data set just by sort of Xing out various values within the data set and doing nothing else. And this is all done automatically um, by the algorithm, which applies this uh, um, which applies this optimization process and um, the algorithms are described in the literature. The second question is exactly the same questions. Why would certain values be suppressed over, other, over others? Um, this basically, as I said, it's described in, in, in detail in the papers that we published. And um, generally speaking, it's this optimization process that tries to find or yeah, that tries to find an optimal or a good, depends a bit on the configuration, transformation so that risks fall below the specified threshold. And as part of this process, also the option to suppress individual records um, is considered by the algorithm. What exactly did, next question, what exactly did setting canonymity to 11 do to the data set? If we chose another value, say five, um, what would have changed? So setting canonymity to 11 means that in regards to the three variables that I selected as potentially identifying, um, it was made sure that each and every record was not indistinguishable, it was not distinguishable from at least 10 other records. So that's where this 11 comes from, groups of size of at least 11 records that look would look similar to an adversary. And um, if you drop this number from 11 to five, then the group size drops to five. So the requirement would be that each and every record is indistinguishable from at least four other records in the data set. And that would mean that, um, the groups become smaller, so the privacy risk becomes a bit higher or the degree of protection becomes lower, but at the same time, we would have been able to get more utility out of the data set. So less generalization, less reductions in fidelity, and likely also a reduction in the number of suppressed records. And these are all things that you can very easily um, find out yourself by playing around with ARX, changing the K value, and then you can study Take a look at the suppressed records and uh, also at the degree of fidelity that you have of the data set, and you should see an impact of reducing this number. Um, the next question would be, can you elaborate on what is meant by risk threshold in the original data set? What does 20% risk mean in practice? So. <clears throat> and this basically means, so when anonymizing data, we always have a uh, or when we apply those more, let's say, formal or mathematical anonymization processes, we always have a mathematical model to capture the risk of privacy breaches or re-identification. One such model is canonymity. It's basically a model because it says from the, from the adversary's perspective, the data set looks not, not as a data set consisting of individual records, but a data set consisting of groups of records. And those groups are indistinguishable. So based on the individuals within the groups are indistinguishable. So this basically means that the individuals are hidden within a crowd, right? Which improves their or protects their privacy. And, but then there is, a, then there's still a certain risk because if, for example, I as an adversary simply pick out one of the records of the group that I think is now the individual that I want to re-identify, then there's a certain likelihood that my guess is actually correct. And this likelihood becomes bigger and bigger the smaller the, groups get, the group gets. So one way of modeling risks, and that's also how it is done in ARX in this risk analysis perspective with the distribution and the journalist, prosecutor, and marketer risk is to take a look at the 
uniqueness of data, so the size of groups of indistinguishable records, and to estimate the risk basically by inverting the size. So one divided by the size gives you the likelihood that if I do a random guess to an individual that uh, that would be one of the suitable individuals that my guess is actually correct. And this means that the 20% risk basically corresponds with five anonymity. And by uh, taking a look at the uh, uniqueness of the individuals in a data set, you can also, and that was is what AREX does, come up with a distribution of the, the risks now in the data set. And then you can specify a threshold. So basically specifying K anonymity and say, I want five anonymity to be, uh, to be provided for my output data set corresponds to saying, I want risks to drop below a threshold of 20%. Of course, very important to say, risk within this model, right? We have generated a model and said risk is specified through the uniqueness. And then you can uh, talk about risk thresholds, but you usually need risk thresholds for all the privacy models. So if you use L diversity, L doesn't say anything about the size of groups, but it says how many different values should be in a group. Still, it's like a risk threshold, a knob that you can turn. You can say, you oh, I want three diversity, I want five diversity. The same with differential privacy. It has parameters, and when you change the parameters, um, then you get higher or lower degrees of protection, and the risk threshold is usually just a certain sort of cutoff point where you say, okay, when I use this parameter, I assume that my risk is low enough um, so, so that I'm sort of confident about the degree of protection that I have achieved. Next question. Can ARX analyze transformed data sets and provide um, assessments on which privacy models have been applied? Um, yes, this can be done to a certain degree. So you can use the protected data set, you can load it as an input data set, and then you can perform risk analysis within ARX. Um, the risk analysis within the UI currently doesn't show um, for example, whether L diversity holds or whether K anonymity holds. Um, but what you can do is you, and for this, you don't need any generalization hierarchies or anything. You can simply specify the privacy, um, the privacy guarantees that you think should hold for the data set and then set a suppression limit to 100% and anonymize the data set. And if those privacy uh, guarantees that you have specified really hold for the data set, then the you should receive exactly the input data set as output data set without anything um, being suppressed. So that's one way to use ARX to check whether certain guarantees hold. Next question, is it possible to export the transformation process as a script that can be later reapplied to the original data set <clears throat> to, genera uh, to generate the anonymized data set? So unfortunately, this is not possible. What is possible, of course, is that you can export the anonymized data set. Um, there is a project file, um, as, I, as I said, ARX is project-based, so you, you, can, you can store a project and within the project file, there's some information on what exactly has been done to the data set. Um, so, um, but we currently don't have a mechanism for exporting the exact process and then reapplying it. It's different if you use ARX, the programming library. I mentioned it's also available as a Java programming library. So if you can program in Java, um, then of course you can or in a Java compatible language. So everything that's compatible to the Java virtual machine that applies to a range of other languages as well. Um, then you can of course script the anonymization process and have, have it applied later but it's currently not supported through the graphical version that I demonstrated today. So next question is, in the papers that introduce L diversity and take closeness, they used income as a sensitive attribute. However, the GDPR does not consider income as sensitive information. What are your views on this matter? Um, that's, um, I'm, I'm not well informed to answer this question. I, I wasn't aware of the fact that income is not considered a sensitive information. I think, I would also expect that there is no general answer that the GDPR would give on these types of questions. It really, again, depends on the context. If um, you're sharing data within a consent, a context where the recipient slash adversary might be interested in finding out something about your income, but he or she shouldn't, um, then this is clearly sensitive um, information. So my answer here would be that needs to be decided on a context uh, specific basis. Next question is, is the user able to customize their, customize their own adversary model? Um, yes, yes, 
of course, um, but only within the framework of the methods supported by the software, you can model your adversary by specifying what are sensitive variables, what are identifying variables, what are quasi-identifying variables by um, having um, a population data set loaded, potentially, if you have one, and also particularly important by using a risk model that reflects what you think that the adversary might um, want to know. So short answer is yes, um, but of course, only through the methods that are available in the ARX. And then we come to the final uh, question. What happens when the requesting setting cannot be enforced if the, for example, if the suppression is set to 0% and, but suppression would be needed to certify the requested gain anonymity? That is a very good question. Um, in this case, uh, the software would uh, indicate this by providing you with no result. Um, so then if after you run the anonymization process in the utility and risk analysis perspective, the result side of things would be empty and only by going in the exploration perspective, explicitly selecting a certain um, transformation that does not fulfill your privacy requirement and applying it, you would then be able to see how the result would look like. Um, but this is, of course, a case that is handled in the software. Good, I think that was the last question. Um, with that, I thank you very much for the attention. We're just a little bit over time. Um, yeah, I think uh, Biro, I would uh, give back to you. Great, thank you so much Fabian for this excellent presentation. This week we have covered topics on data anonymization and data anonymization tools for quantitative research data. I hope you are as stimulated as I am by this week's presentations. And in about two weeks time on October 17th and 18th, we also have a great lineup for data de-identification with qualitative research data. Hope to see you in the next workshop. Thank you again, Fabian. Uh -huh.